I'm so glad that you've chosen to tune in to this episode in the Beyond Addiction series. In our previous session, we were looking at spirituality as an important factor in, uh, in the healing process as we come out of the world of addiction, out of that lifestyle. Well, I'd like to continue to talk uh, a little bit about what it, how it is that we shape ourselves, how it is that we become the type of people that we are. This session, we're talking about shaping who we are, the consequences of thought. Have you ever noticed that there are two kinds of elderly people in this world? There are those who are really sweet, and on the other hand, there are those who are really obnoxious. It almost seems that as a person gets older in life, they become more entrenched in the way they were when they were younger. If they were a kind, sweet, loving young person, uh, they would typically grow up to, to have those characteristics accentuated in their old age. These are the kind of grandparents you want to have. These are the kind of grandparents who you are excited to visit. These are the kind of grandparents who once you get there on holiday, you don't want to leave there too, too fast. On the other hand, you also get that those old people who, uh, well, let's just say as they have cultivated criticism, as they have cultivated a sharp tongue as a young person and they grow up, th those aspects are accentuated. And when they get to old age, this is the type of old people who you do not want to have as your uh, grandparents. If you do have those kind of grandparents, you'll know you don't want to spend too much time there. You want to get to their house and leave as soon as possible. What is it about old people that it seems that, that, that their younger characteristics come to fruition and mature in a more accentuated way as they get older? Is it just an accident? Is it just chance? Or is there something that, that you can do to prevent yourself from falling into that obnoxious character as you get older? Is there, is there something that you might be able to do, some power of choice that you might be able to exercise that would help you to ensure that you are one of those sweet elderly people when you finally reach that stage of life? Is it all just chance? Does it just happen by mistake? Is it just an accident? Or is it something we choose as we grow older? What on earth does this have to do with addiction, you're asking? Very simple. We cultivate the kind of people we're going to become. And as we get older in life, the choices we've made when we are younger mature and solidify the type of person we are. If we are choosing a lifestyle of addiction and pleasure-seeking, if we are choosing a lifestyle of putting ourselves first, we will eventually become that type of person when we're older and people are not going to want to have too much to do with us. Have you ever noticed that older people are generally less flexible than younger people? You know, older people typically have their way of doing things. They have their, their routine for the day. They have their way of approaching life, of, of, of dealing with issues. And, and younger people are more flexible. You know, when you're in a church environment, you notice this as well. The older generation, they like the way they do church. Don't mess with the liturgy. Don't change the order of service. Don't change the type of songs we sing. But younger people come along and they're willing to mix it up a little bit more. Why is it that younger people are more flexible, more willing to try new things than older people as a general rule? Of course, there are some exceptions along the way, but as a general rule, you'll notice this. You know, our older people, our older generation, they are more set in their ways. They've been doing this for so long in this way. It's working for them. Don't mess with it. Don't change it. Younger people come along and say, why must I do it that way? Why? And often this causes a, a bit of tension between the generations. Why is it that this happens as we go through life? Have you ever noticed that the longer you act a certain way, the easier it is to continue to act that way? You know, you have to really think about your approach to life in the beginning. You have to think about how am I going to deal with this person in that circumstance? What would be the best approach? But after you've practiced it a few times, you don't even think about it anymore. You just react a certain way. You know, think about your vocabulary that you use. At one point, you have to think about the words you're using. You have to choose them. You have to line them up. You have to consider what would be the best way to express this idea. But what happens as you get older? That vocabulary flows. You're able to, to, to speak almost without thinking consciously of how to verbalize the thought that's in your mind. How is it that in the beginning it's a very conscious experience and as you grow older it becomes a far more automatic process? 
So by way of example here, we want to look at the neurobiology that is behind the way a person becomes set in their ways, the way a person forms the type of character that they are going to be as they get to the later stages of life. What is it that happens inside the brain that solidifies and, and it, it helps a person get to the point where they are who they are and it becomes very difficult to change them in their ways? Well, it works like this. We have neural pathways inside the brain which are reinforced every time we think a certain thought or act in a certain way. So every time one thinks a thought or performs an action, it is easier to think the same thought or perform the same action next time. In other words, the brain is an organ that you train. It will eventually act on autopilot, basically, but you first, at some stage in your life, have to train the brain how to react a certain way, how to think a certain way, how to deal with various stimuli in a certain way. In the beginning, it's very conscious, but as you go through life and you encounter those stimuli a few times and you, you act a certain way again and again, eventually you begin to act that way without even thinking. Eventually, you can uh, almost react in your sleep, so let's have a look here at how this works. When you were young, you had to learn to, tr to tie your shoelaces, right? If you were like me, when you were born, you didn't come out with an automatic ability to tie your shoelaces. You, you, for the first few years of your life, your parents had to put your shoes on you. They had to do the tying of the shoelaces. When your shoe came off, you had to go to mommy and daddy and say, oh, my shoe came off, I need you to put it back on, and so on and so forth. At a certain age in life, they got tired of putting your shoes on for you, and so they said, this is how you do it. You put you undo the shoelace, you put your foot in, then you do uh, the first part, then you make this little bow thing, you put your finger there, you take it over, you pull it through, and so on and so forth. They took you step by step, consciously and slowly, through the learning process of how to tie your shoelace. Eventually, they didn't have to tell you anymore because it was part of memory. You were still having to think about it. You were maybe even lip-syncing as you did the process. You were like, okay, now I do this, and now I do that, and then this, and then I put my finger there, I take the bow over, I pull it through, and there I've tied my shoelace. Eventually, you get to the point where you're not thinking about it anymore. There's something on television, and you're sitting on the couch. Your shoelace is untied. You look down. You are, are watching television. You've got those two little pieces of string in your hand. While you are watching TV, you're doing it automatically. You're not even thinking about it. Eventually, you get to a point where you are, are able to talk to someone, have a conversation, reason with them while you're tying your shoelace. You are no longer thinking about it consciously. You are doing it automatically. You're doing it on autopilot because you have started off consciously. You've trained your mind. The neural pathways have been activated. And every time that neural pathway is activated again and again to tie your shoelaces, it strengthens that neural pathway. Eventually, you do not even need to think about it consciously. You can simply tell the brain, as it were, tie my shoelaces, and it sends the messages to the hands, to the fingers, and it does it all automatically while you are consciously busy doing something else. It, 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 it is a process which you have learned and you've trained your mind to be able to do. The same thing applies to driving. You will know that when you first got into a car, you had to think consciously about how to use the accelerator in relation, relation to the clutch pedal and the brakes. Uh, this is assuming you're not driving an automatic vehicle. Uh, we're driving a stick shift vehicle. So you get into that car, you put the key in the ignition, you turn it, you turn, uh, the, the engine comes into action, and now you're still not moving. The car is idling. Now you have to push in the clutch while the handbrake is still up, put it in first gear. Then you have to take the, 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 the handbrake in your, in your one hand while you gently release your foot off the, off the clutch pedal. You at the same time have to accelerate gently, not too much, not too little. Too little, the car will stall. Too much, you will be over revving. It will be, the engine will be going mad for no reason. And uh, you have to get this coordination between letting the handbrake down, taking your foot off the clutch, and accelerating at the same time. If you've ever learned to drive a stick shift vehicle, you'll know what I'm talking about. It takes a a few weeks or a few months to really get this thing down, to really figure it out, so that eventually you don't have to think about it. You stall a car, it jerks for a while, everybody drives past and goes, oh, there's a learner driver, you've got that big L in the back, that big embarrassing L that means I drive super slow while everybody's trying to get to work. You, you've got to, to really consciously, you get to the, the stop street, you have been going, you have already put it in gear, you've gotten to the stop street now, oh, now 
the whole thing starts all over again. You've got to pull up the handbrake. You've got to push the clutch in. You've got to do that so the car doesn't stall as you're stopping. Then once you want to get going again, you've got to let the handbrake down. You've got to take your foot off the clutch. You've got to accelerate at just the right pace to, to not jerk, to not over rev, to not stall. You will know that as you've learned to drive a stick shift, you have stalled many times in very embarrassing and awkward situations. But hopefully, if you've been driving for a while, you have moved past those early failings. You no longer even have to think about driving consciously. You can get into the car half asleep, you know, just still trying to wake up in the morning and you're in the car on the way to work. You're still not functioning on all cylinders of your brain yet and you're able to drive your vehicle. You can do it almost without thinking. Eventually, you can be eating an ice cream, talking on your cell phone, changing gears and accelerating at the same time. Of course, I'm not advocating that. That would probably eventually end up in an accident. But people get to a point where they can be listening to the radio, having a conversation with a passenger in the vehicle, stopping at a stop street, pulling off from that stop street, doing this all without even consciously thinking about it. In the beginning, it had to be very conscious, very deliberate, very thought out. Now, later on in life, you're doing it automatically without even thinking about it because you have over time programmed those neural pathways to the point where they no longer need conscious permission and they no longer need conscious direction. They are trained and those thoughts and those neural impulses that communicate between the brain and the muscles and the coordination aspects of, of what you need to be able to drive your vehicle all happens on autopilot, no conscious thought involved. You see, there are neural pathways which develop much like a path through the grass in a field. So you know that as you are walking through a new field, there is no path. The tendency if you're walking with a group of people is that you will walk behind each other and uh, the first person will be the trailblazer and everybody else will sort of walk in that pathway. Well, when that has happened a few times, you know, maybe it's a cutting across a field so you don't have to go around the long way around a corner in a road. You're a pedestrian and so you cut straight across the field from the one road to the other. Typically, the line that will be taken will be the same by all people. There are very few people who will say, oh, look, there's a path that's already been made. I'm going to walk next to it or for a new path. We will all walk in the same path that has been worn out. And as a result of that, no grass will ever grow there again because as the grass grows, that grass will be killed by the next footstep of the person who walks on that path. So that path will become more and more entrenched. The more entrenched it is, the more visible it is, the more likely it is for people to walk along that path. Have you, are you getting the analogy? Same thing happens inside of your brain with the neural pathways. There are set... Uh, Paths that we train our brain on, initially consciously. The pathway is not there yet, it's not fixed there yet, and that's why young people are so much more flexible than older people. Older people have neural pathways which are well-worn. If you look under a certain type of microscope in, into the brain, you will see these as white patches inside the brain where the brain neurons have been exercised and just like a muscle, their density has increased. More neurons have become involved in this pathway. So it forms almost like a thick strand, if you like, of, ner of, of, of nerves in this pathway. And thus, when the brain needs to decide on how to send a certain message, it will typically use the pathways that are already entrenched within the brain. So just like you walking on the path, you'll typically not walk new in the field where, where there is no path. You will choose a path if it's already there. So too, through conscious thought, you wear a path, a groove, a white patch, a thick uh, bundle of nerves come into action. They begin to form a partnership inside of the brain. And through conscious thought, you've developed this. And so when you need to perform that action again, it can happen automatically because the pathway is already there. You do not need to consciously build the pathway. You've done that as a young person. Person. So older people have these neural pathways. They're entrenched. They like to do a certain thing a certain way because that's what they're accustomed to. That's, what that's how the brain works. Younger people are still fashioning their pathways. They're still working out. How am I, how am I going to do this? What am I going to say in this circumstance? How am I going to deal with this type of person? What, am I gonna be, what are going to be the choices of, of uh, how I deal with life situations? So younger people 
are typically more flexible, better able to change the way they do things while they're younger because those pathways are not yet worn into the brain. Same thing applies to older people. Older people who are either really sweet or really obnoxious have trained themselves over the years as a young person to think a certain way, to react a certain way, to deal with people in a certain way. So as they get to the later years where the brain is solidified, where the brain is not so, uh, not so plastic, not so flexible anymore, those neural pathways are there. This is how we think. This is how we deal with things. So if they have cultivated the graces, the Christian graces of love and long-suffering and patience and of kindness and of gentleness, then typically as they grow older, they will be that way. Whereas the person who has cultivated the spirit of criticism and backbiting and, and evil speaking and suspicion will typically be that way accentuated when they are much older. So let's have a look here on the screen. And what I'm going to show you is a little schematic, a little animation of how this happens. Here is a brain, and this brain is going to think a certain pathway, or think a certain thought. Initially, you will see we'll represent it by a very thin little white line that represents the neural pathway that is used and consciously formed as that first thought is thought, or that thir first action is performed. We're going to think it again and again, and you're going to see that little white line getting thicker and thicker as time goes on. Repres Representing the fact that we're forming those, that pathway through the brain, brain, the neural pathway, the white patch, which eventually leads to a person being able to act or, um, automatically instead of consciously. So here we go. First thought, there it is, we're thinking it again and again, that white patch is getting stronger and stronger, and the automatic pathway has now fully developed to the point where I no longer even need conscious thought to deal with what I need to deal with. It just happens automatically. So, we can summarize it this way in terms of the neurobiology of character development. How I form the person that I will one day become. Your thoughts that are thought repeatedly over time lead to actions. You know, all action begins with thought. You don't just wake up one day and decide to be an adulterer. You don't just wake up one day and decide to be a drug addict. There is usually a thought process before that, whereby temptation is involved, dwelling upon the subject is involved, imagining is involved. That's why in the New Testament scriptures, Jesus comes along and he says, you think it's only adultery when you physically get into bed with a woman, but I tell you, you think of her lustfully, you imagine it, you fantasize about it, you have already committed adultery. That's why pornography is out. Because although I may not be getting into bed with someone, I am already committing that act in my mind, in my imagination. Given the right circumstances and the right opportunities, I would automatically do it. I have cultivated those neural pathways, that way of thinking, that way of thinking about women. And so every time I look at that woman, I think lust. Every time I see someone with long, pretty legs, I think lustful thoughts. And I automatically begin to imagine things. Because that's at some point in my life, I have dwelt on it. Those, those thoughts have, become, have formed neural pathways. And given the right opportunities at the right time with the right person, those thoughts will be translated into physical actions. So Jesus comes along and he says, guess what? Sin happens a long time before it manifests in action. Sin is something that breathes inside the mind in the thought process before it actually becomes an action outwardly. So thoughts repeated over time will form actions. Actions repeated over time will form habits. Those neural pathways are strengthening. First, the thought process, the imagination is there. Then what happens is I begin to carry out that action. I carry, the, uh, carry out that action a few times, and eventually I do not even need to think about it anymore. So I had to first spend time thinking about tying my shoelaces. Then I had to spend a little while actually carrying out that action consciously and slowly. Then I could do it by habit without even thinking about it. It just came naturally. Habits repeated over over time form character. They shape who we are. Character is who and what you are when no one's looking. When you're in the, in the dark, as it were, and you know you cannot get caught for a certain action, will you carry out that action? You know, a lot of people will control the way they act. They will control their behavior simply for the fear of being caught. But character is who you are when no one's looking. Character is like, if I knew I could not get caught for stealing this money, would I steal it? If my, only, if my only objection, if the only reason I don't carry out this action is because I'm scared of getting caught, then I have a flawed character. True character will say, no, that is, a moral, uh, that is a moral fall. I do not want to have that moral weakness in my character. So even when no one's looking, I will do the ethical thing. I will not steal.
Does that make sense to you? So when you think thoughts that lead to actions which form habits, they will eventually form who you are. They will form your character. You will notice we have two streams going here. One going upward, positive thoughts leading to positive actions, leading to positive habits, leading to positive character formation, which ultimately will lead to a positive eternal destiny. The other stream of action here is that we, th we think negative thoughts, which lead to negative habits, which form a negative and a broken character, which ultimately will lead to a negative eternal destiny. Are you with us so far? You see, the type of person who you are one day is not going to happen by accident. You are choosing every day of your life the type of person that you will become. You are choosing every day of your life, from the very beginning of your life, whether you will have an addictive personality, where you, where, where you will have a, 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 a character which is subject to the perverted appetites of your depraved nature. You are choosing every day through your choice to form a character either preparing you for heaven or preparing you for the other place. You will choose your eternal destiny based on the choices, the small choices of your everyday life because those small choices are, are the result of your thoughts. You choose which way you want to think. You choose what actions you perform. You choose what habits you form, which means you will choose ultimately what character you are made of and the character you are made of will determine where you will spend your eternity. You see, I share this with you in the context of addiction because many, very often our addictive habits, our faulty lifestyle patterns are the result first and foremost, of faulty thinking patterns. It all starts in the mind. It all starts in the thought. If we are going to dwell on these things, if we are going to think about these things and fill our lives with the influences that tend in that direction, then we are going to be shaped and made into the image of the things that we think of. The thoughts we choose to think will determine who we will ultimately become. It will be no accident. So in summary, by beholding, we are changed. By beholding, we are either changed positively or by beholding, we are changed negatively. You see, this has to do with the solution to the addiction problem. We may have formed a character, a habit, a set of habits, or, or, or we may be thinking certain thoughts that drive us in a certain direction. But listen, if you want to come out of that world of addiction, if you want to come out of that world of slavery, you have to start thinking new thoughts, forming new actions, new habits, and a new character will result. By beholding, by beholding outside of ourselves, not by looking inward, but by beholding a new and positive influence in our lives, a new and positive spiritual influence in our lives, we will be able to find the power for genuine change. So let's have a look at how this works. And I just love the way it's put here in both the positive and the negative way. By beholding, we become changed, though formed in the image of his maker, man can so educate his mind that sin which he once loathed will become pleasant to him. You can teach yourself to love the fruits of evil. You can teach yourself to love the lifestyle of addiction and slavery. You can teach yourself to things which you once looked at and you said, no, I don't want that for my life. By indulging those things, you can actually cultivate a love for those things. On the other hand, it's not all negative. What about the positive side of that? Well, by beholding, we become changed, morally assimilated to the one who is perfect in character. The image of Christ is cherished, and it captivates the whole being. You see, by beholding, we can surround ourselves with those influences which are going to contribute to changing us negatively. Put evil thoughts, evil imaginings in our hearts. Place evil desires in our hearts. We will then take action based on those thoughts and those actions. We will form habits based on those actions. We will form a character based on the habits and that will determine a negative destiny for us. On the other hand, on the positive side, we could choose to surround ourselves with positive spiritual influences. We may choose to, to dwell on the character of Christ on His glory and on His power. We may choose to behold the one who never sinned, who came, who was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. The one who had perpetual victory in His life. We can choose to dwell upon His character, on His example, and thus form new thoughts, awaken our minds to new possibilities. We can, we can take new actions in harmony with those new thoughts. We can form new positive habits that replace the old negative habits. We can go from those positive habits to forming a positive 
character and we can spend eternity with God in heaven. Those are our two options. Fill the mind with junk, you will get junk out. It will lead to faulty thinking patterns, faulty acting patterns, faulty habits, and faulty character. Or you can fill your mind with positive spiritual influences. Dwell upon the pattern of Christ's character on his life, on his way of dealing with people and with situations, on the secret of his success in overcoming the very temptations that you and I have been drawn into and where we have failed. We can form these new thoughts leading to new actions, a new character, new habits, and thus an eternally joyful destiny. You see, friends, it is within your power to choose. It is within your power to think new thoughts. It is within your power to choose what you will dwell on, what the influences of your life will be. You are forming neural pathways with every thought you think, with every action you take. How is it with you today? Are you ch forming the mind and cherishing the right pattern that is going to help you to get through life and get out of the problem of addiction? We all, as the Bible summarizes this concept in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18, we all with unveiled face behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. We are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. What does the Bible say? What did that previous author say about the secret to overcoming success? It's not by looking within. It's by looking outside. It's by patterning ourselves after the great and perfect pattern, the Lord Jesus Christ. We behold His his glory and thus we are changed from what we are into his glory we find strength we find health we find healing not through self-help techniques but by focusing our attention and our mind on the one who succeeded where we failed we behold him and by beholding him we are changed into his likeness that is the secret of overcoming the problem of addiction you see built into the bible promises is a keen understanding of neurobiology God who designed the mind understands how the mind works and he knows you cannot save yourself in your own strength by your own methods but when you look to him when you make him the focus of your attention he will share with you his character and his power the bottom line is really quite simple, friends. The bottom line is that we are to love God with our whole mind. As Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. He wants our whole being. And how do we give Him our mind? We focus our attention on Him. We go to the Word of God. We study His life, His teachings, and we model our thoughts, our actions, our habits, and our character after His own. That is the true success uh, principle that I share with you today that will help you overcome any sin challenge in your life and especially the problem of addiction. You will not overcome by constantly trying to overcome. Does that make sense to you? The more you think about not thinking about your temptation, the more you think about not thinking about your weakness, the more you are focusing your attention on your weakness. You need something new, something different, something positive outside of yourself. Fix your attention on Christ and the beauty of His character, on His victorious life, and you will find that over time, the mind will begin to change the way it works. New pathways will be formed. New direction will be taken inside the brain. New actions will begin to form. And while it may be conscious and deliberate in the beginning, just like it was as you had to lead yourself into the paths of wickedness, so too, over time, it will become automatic to think a new way, to believe a new way, to act a new way, and you will be forming a character in harmony with Jesus Christ. He will be sharing his life of victory with you by you focusing your attention on him. Do not focus on the problem. Do not focus on your need to overcome the problem, but focus on the one who is the solution to the problem. Focus on his character, his power, his life of victory, and his character, his power, and his life of victory will become yours. So I share that principle with you. May God bless you as you find victory in Jesus Christ and allow me to share a word of prayer with you. Heavenly Father, will you take the mind and the attention of the viewer to yourself? Will you fix their mind and their heart upon you, upon your character, upon your life of victory? And will you share that victory with them? Will you rewire the neural pathways in their brain? so that they will experience what it means to have the mind of Christ in them, to, to, to love you with all their heart, with all their mind, to have everything surrendered to you, the life of peace and joy that comes from that, and the power to overcome addiction. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.